so I already kind of did the first part. I kind of wanted to see where everybody was in their process, and so that I we could kind of tailor this experience to uh, what you're looking for as far as writing is concerned. Um, I think one of the uh, the first things that I have on here is you know deciding where you want to start. Who is starting? You are starting. Okay. Um, so basically, whenever you start writing, you need to decide what your level of commitment is to your writing. So are you wanting this to be the career? Are you wanting to make the Harry Potter books? Or you know, what, what's the dream here? Or is this your hobby that you just, something you want to do for fun? So I think right out the gate, you need to decide. And so you can set reasonable expectations for yourself. Um, if you're serious about writing, you need to commit to writing every day. Work it into your schedule. So I try to write at least, I write on my lunch hour every day, at least a thousand words every day is my goal. Do you have a goal? Yeah, um, it's about a thousand every day and it's, it's not a set time, it depends on when I have time. Uh, but yeah, in the morning I get up early before work, uh, but yeah, both of us work full time. So that's, that's the hard thing, to be a writer you have to, uh, you got to have a real job. I mean, it sucks to say that. But it's a means to an end. Yeah, there's, you go into Barnes and Noble and there's how many authors out there uh, and how many books out there and how many of those are really making a living writing. Uh, a lot of them are hobby writers mm -hmm. who also have real jobs. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah, so if you want to be a hobby writer, be a hobby writer, yeah. you know? And you can still have the same level of professionalism. Mm -hmm. I've right. come across a core of different uh, writers who say, yeah, I work for a living. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, almost every, there's very few authors out there that that's all they do for a living. There's, there's only one Stephen King, there's only one J.K. Rowling, uh, but there is a hundred thousand of us. You know, and that's nothing wrong with that. Which is that you, you still have fun writing, you still tell your stories, you can still get your stories out there, but you, have, you do have to have a reasonable expectation for what your career is going to be, and that's the first hurdle that a lot of people get because they look at J.K. Rowling or they look at Stephen King or Terry Brooks and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be that. And it's sad to say, but most people aren't going to be that. And so set a reasonable expectation for yourself. Have fun telling your stories. Tell your stories. Get your stories out there. But if you set the bar too high, you'll be, you, the blows will hurt more. You're going to disappoint you know, yourself. Because the blows, they do come. I've got a stack. Rejections. I've got a stack of rejection <laughs> letters. You'd be good at that. So. Yep. And they hurt more if you're like, oh, I'm going to be up here. And then you keep getting rejected. And you're like, oh, I'm never going to get up there. Set that, set that expectation to reason. You can still write. You can still tell the stories. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you're trying to obtain a literary agent and you're, you're submitting your queries, um, just because you do get rejections doesn't mean that your work isn't good. It doesn't mean that you can't get a traditional uh, publishing agreement. All that means is that you haven't found the right person at the right time to represent you. That's all that means. Um, I'm a firm believer of there's a there is an audience for every story that's out there. So trust me when I say this that your story there is an audience for it out there. So. Just because somebody doesn't pick up on it because it's not whatever the trend is in the marketplace right now, doesn't mean that in the future that will roll right back around and somebody pick it up later. And people like J.K. Rowling and Stephen King, if you've ever read, uh, I would recommend reading the memoirs on writing, Stephen King. He talks about in his book, whenever he was a kid and he started writing, he had this nail on his wall. And all of his rejections, he would put them on this nail. Well, he filled up the nail. Yeah. So he had to get another one to put all these rejections on there. So, you know, if somebody like that has to overcome all those rejections, it's the same for all of us. So don't get discouraged by it. You just have to try and learn from it. That's all. I think Vince, Vince Flynn, you know, I've listened to him talk uh, the past couple of years back, but he writes, he writes similar to... Um, you know, political thriller and spy books and things like that. And he said he got 60 rejections for his first book. He self-published his first three, and then somebody wanted to go back and actually pick his first book up for traditional publishing. 
So you just never know. Blake Northcutt, who I recently started to find, she writes mostly comic books, but she started a novel that got rejected many, many times, and then she took it to Kickstarter. And now, somebody wants to represent her. You just never know. So don't take those rejections personally. They really are the right person at the right time. Or try and to remember. The if industry was, has changed too. Yeah. Anymore, they don't want to pick anybody up unless you already have a platform of X amount of followers on Twitter, and they they just won't even entertain it if you don't already have your base out there. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of struggle with that because. Um, that's what I want a literary agent with, is to help me establish my platform mm -hmm. for by my doing all your work for you. It's you that know? Whole, it's that whole you have to have the thing to get the thing. Yeah. They want the experience before they. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first submitted, uh, one of my first short stories was uh, I had just read Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, and I wrote uh, a vampire <clears throat> story in a similar style, a similar theme to Bram Stoker's book. And I submitted it to a magazine and got rejected because nobody wants vampire stories. And this was probably 20 years ago. And then along came Stephen Meyer. Yeah, and everybody wants vampire stories. So the right person at the right time with the right story. That's really what it is. Well, if you look at the industry as a whole, I mean, it ebbs and flows as far as you know. You have vampires, and you have werewolves, and then there's zombies, and now there's superheroes, you know? Um, so the industry itself is fickle, and by the time you end up spending time to write a book, that train could have sailed. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't come back around, yeah. because those themes tend to yes. recirculate um, through. Look all the TV shows that are made. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can see it in TV. Yeah, the, re the, the rewrites, the, the, the reboots. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you see all that. Well, mm -hmm. So what about... Well, I'm gonna go, uh, um, you want to yeah. do like a uh, writing style? Yeah, um, outline. Who, who outlines? I think we're both opposite on that one. Who here writes outlines? Do you outline your story? Well, what I, since I'm more visual, I kind of write a, what I call a narrative outline. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is how it starts. This is where the character starts. Where I want it to end, and then I try to fill in the middle of kind of what's going to get from point A to point B. There, and I think I expect you outline quite a lot. A little bit. I really don't outline very much. Um, I started out my first couple books, I outlined a lot of it, but after that, I started just sitting down on the blank screen and just uh, uh, typing. But um, I think I've developed into a more discovery type of writer in which I don't, when I started my first trilogy, I didn't know how the story would end. So the story takes me where it wants to take me. The characters go where I feel they need to go. It's more of a discovery writing. I don't do a lot of, I don't do a lot of world building. I kind of build my world as I go and as I discover it and kind of, um, that way you're not locked into, this has to happen there, this has to happen now. Uh, it, it has a better flow to it, and it seems more realistic, especially if your characters have certain personalities. Um, I see sometimes where writers try to force a character to do something for the purpose of plot. But then I'm like, why would that character do that? That doesn't make any sense in line with the character. So you really have to to focus on, because the story is about the characters. So if you really got to do them justice on the page. So, and, and it, the story can feel forced if you if you don't follow in line with yeah. how your character um, perceives their world, I guess. Yeah. What if you don't write, like, I've been on the politics for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I really would like to write a story about some of my experiences, but mm -hmm. changing the names to protect the guilty and innocent of the life. Obviously. So so that's like based on real life mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So how do you write that? Because that's already where it goes, but no. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be something that's pretty much, I, that's kind of already outlined because that's a timeline in your past. Yeah. So I would say, if, if I were to do that type of book, I think I would outline it and, and hit those key points to make sure 
that you've got your don't miss anything. yeah don't miss anything no. um, I'd imagine there would be a lot of dialogue in that time but no <laughs> I guess the point definitely is that there's no right way to do it, and I've, and I've sat in a lot of workshops at different uh, conventions and things, and a lot of authors will say this, so I'll borrow it from the last guy, um, Maxwell, uh, uh, Maxwell Drake said that people don't ever listen to somebody who's going to tell you they can teach you how to write. Um, they can tell you what they do, and you adapt that to your style and your personal experience, your personal preference. Uh, there are some authors that will tell you, here's how to get published. That's garbage. They can tell you how they got published. It won't necessarily work for you. Um, so outlining or discovery or through stream of thought, stream of thought, stream of consciousness writing, none of those are the right way to do it. But make sure that it works for you. Um, I don't outline at all. Um, I have literally the next chapter of my book plan while I'm writing the current chapter I'm in, and it changes based on what I finish in that chapter. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I do know the end, that's probably the only difference. I, don't. Uh, I know where my story <laughs> will end, I just don't necessarily know how I'll get there. Um, I don't know how many chapters it's going to take, I don't know how many characters it's going to take, because, like she said, a lot of times it, you'll see authors say this and, and you wonder, what do they mean? My characters surprise me. I like it when they surprise me. Well, how can my characters surprise me when I'm writing what happens? Mm -hmm. But it's because I know what the characters do, and then I write a scene, and I'm like, well, how, I, how will my characters react to that? I don't plan out how they'll react. It's based on the scene that I just wrote, and they do the thing that they do, and then I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I keep going with that. That's sort of discovery writing or stream of thought writing, mm -hmm. as opposed to outlining. I just can't outline. I don't like it. I've never liked it. So as discovery writers, do you find you struggle with a satisfying ending? Because uh, I know I mean, Stephen King is a discovery writer, and that's one of his weaknesses. He doesn't have many, but I, I've read some of his books that were the ending was outstanding, and others was like I tossed the book away and discuss. Yeah. So I could see that as a reader if you have a preset expectation. Um, I know I think endings for any. I don't care if you're a discovery or a discovery writer or an outliner. I think it needs to be tricky, mm -hmm. no matter what style writing that you have. So um, that's just always going to be something that no no writer wants to leave their reader with a bad taste in their mouth, right? Yeah. And because you want them to buy the next book. Right. Um, so I think that it, it's a challenge, no matter no matter what you do, but I don't know if discovery writers struggle with that more than outliners. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the, the ending we want to tell is there, uh, but it's not always the ending that, that the reader wants. And that's the other thing that you will definitely have to accept as a writer. Not everybody's going to like what you write. Uh, don't take it personally. You're not writing for everybody. You're getting your story out there. Some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it, a lot of people are going to fall in between. That's just the way it goes, um, and you can't take it personally because they're not their satisfaction or dissatisfaction of your story or the end of your story or one of your characters or how things go is not a reflection of you. That's a reflection of how they perceived the story and how they took it. So, you know, if your ending isn't good for somebody, you know that you still read Stephen King, even though you didn't like the ending of one of his books. That's not a reflection of Stephen. If you met Stephen, you'd probably be ecstatic and love to talk to him is no reflection at all of the ending of the books that you didn't like. Because it's the book, it's the story that was the problem. Which that's going to be normal for everybody. And a lot of people, a lot of authors, especially new authors, take that personally. It's Stephen King also has controversial characters. He does talk about it in his memoirs. He gets hate mail. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I've read, I've read that book yeah. on writing. And um, I, I just laughed. He gets I, I laughed. On it. And he's like, <laughs> that's not my personal view. That is my character. My character is not me, unless you're talking about The Shining, and I believe that that was actually you know, the author of The Shining was supposed to be written, supposedly. So, um, but uh, even that is a dramatic, <laughs> little story. But you know, all things aside, you know what you write in your work. If it's that's your work, that doesn't. It's not necessarily a reflection of you. So people are going to hate regardless. So you have to learn to be able to develop some type of a thick skin and be able to take it at some, some level. So.
So it sounds like we've got a lot of mix between, is it, what, does everybody have a particular genre that they are thinking of writing? I'm just showing the title name of the school. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's nice. It's definitely a required type of writing. Mm -hmm. I've got ideas across several of them. Okay. A lot of different genres. Think of real world and... Well, and also a book on about how to um, be successful about, okay. against the government and following regulations to save parks or something. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Anything said yet? Um, I, I literally have dozens, dozens of ideas from fiction to non-fiction. The one thing that some authors forget, and that you definitely, even if you write real world, um, it's not necessarily going to apply as much to a technical manual or a, or a textbook or things like that, but the world that you set in your writing is important. Um, even if you're writing about the real world, if you're writing about a neighborhood, or you're writing about a village, if you're writing about a fantasy world or a spaceship, um, the world that you create, don't forget that that's a character too. Um, a lot of authors neglect that. Uh, if every, I'm sure everybody knows what Harry Potter is. I don't know if everybody here has read it. But when you get to the point in those stories or in those books or any other book that you've read that's like this, when they introduce things about that world that they don't ever talk about again, like um, the Goblet of Fire, when you find out that there are other schools in the world that teach magic to kids, you know, for two books, or, or two, what, three books? It's been a long time. It's just Hogwarts. It's just the one school in England that all the kids go to learn magic. And all of a sudden you find out there are other schools around the world. You don't ever go to those schools in our stories. The only time you see the students from the other schools in those stories are the couple of times they interact there. But that is her world being a character. That is your, the next time she writes a story, you're like, oh, that's, I want to hear more about this. I want to find out more about this guy who goes out and finds magical creatures. Well, now that's a movie. <laughs> But originally, <laughs> it was just somebody talked about a book about a guy who captured magical creatures, and that's all they talked about. That is, that is the world building that you want to make sure you do. So if you're writing about a neighborhood in New York, or you're writing about a world and a planet nobody's ever heard of before, remember to include things that aren't just your characters. Don't include just the house they live in and the place they go to eat and the things that happen at this place. Remember to include things they remember when they were kids or things that happened in distant areas or we heard on the news that this happened two states away. That helps build your world into something more than just a flat stage where your characters interact with each other to tell your story. I think I read somewhere that the story is like a very small percentage, 10 to 30 percent of your background story. Yeah. Yeah, and that and your background characters. They're also your world and they're also characters. If you just write the waitress that shows up, you only have her in one scene, and she delivers a plate of food, that's a better character if you say, well, she mentioned something about her kids, or she's going to school at night, or you know, she's helping, you know, she's helping her mom who's on bed rest, or whatever. Just a little thing that you put in there will turn that bland, gray, featureless waitress into a character, which will make your world more vibrant, which will make your reader more invested in it. Because, yeah, a lot of readers, the readers who flip through backstory and the droning and droning about describing how awesome your world the is. Info dump. Yeah. The info dump. Yeah. I'm going to tell you about my world. You tell about the world and the writing and the characters and the yeah. environment, not by giving the reader a big info dump. Right. And we, I think we've all read those type of books. Um, one thing that I notice, um, and, and world building is a part of this, is that anytime you have any kind of scene, um, I notice it especially in like fight scenes. And it's just like, it's just flat ground and they're having a, a sword fight or whatever. You know, give some topography. Are there stairs? Is it grass? Are there trees? Are there, you know, they're not just in this wide, voided <laughs> space with nothing mm -hmm. in it. You know, make it believable, you know, choreograph it, you know, okay, they're in this courtyard and there's some stairs over here and there's a tree in the center um, and it's it's gravel so their, their, their feet kind of slip on the gravel or it's sand or, or whatever. It's not just undefined, ambiguous space. I see it, that a lot. So, it sounds like a long time ago I heard that 
a hunter, when he's describing you know, getting that deer or whatever, mm -hmm. they'll give you the lay of the land. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's kind of what, kind of what yeah. Don't forget about that part yeah. of it, the surroundings, you know. And the senses that go along with it. It you was freezing and three feet of is snow. Is there a breeze? Is it cold? Right. Is it, you know, like yeah. are they trying to hold on to their sword but they can't because it's cold out and their 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 hands are numb from the cold, you know, trying to um, it gives it just brings the reader in more. Yeah. And when you do that, and she, like uh, Ray said, that she doesn't do a lot of world building before she writes, and I do a ton of it. Um, that's probably where we differ. Mm -hmm. I built my world years and years ago. I've been a role player since I was a kid. And I built my world that I write in is the same world that I played in. So I have a very vast world that I've built. When you do your world building, don't be discouraged that you're going to know more about it than your readers ever will. You're going to write pages and pages and pages of world that you'll never put in your book. But it's those things that you know about your world will help you build that story. But not everybody does That's that. That's why I don't write. Everybody's different on how they write. You may not do that much world building. But make sure that your scenes at least incorporate something beyond, I mean, you're not writing a stage play. So your characters are not on a stage. Your characters are in a world, so we'll definitely don't forget that. And you were into characters. Character creation, yeah. Character development. Um, I find that the characters are probably, characters and especially I find dialogue is probably the best way to, inner monologue to give your character a, um, convey their motivations. Mm -hmm. um, your characters have to have clear motivations. Um, it's good to give them a little bit of a flaw. Um, nobody's perfect, so if you put perfect characters out there, your readers are going to be a little bit disengaged because nobody's perfect and you want it to be somewhat realistic. That being said, don't forget when you're developing protagonists that your antagonists also, so you don't just want a villain evil for the sake of evil. I think if that villain has a purpose, one that actually makes sense in a crusade that they honestly believe in, it makes that villain all more believable. Um, for example, I'll just say, I don't know if anybody has seen the Infinity War, I thought Thanos was a really good uh, villain because he believed that what he was doing was right for, for the galaxy and he believed in it wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that that made him probably one of the best villains that Marvel's had thus far um, in the MCU. So, I don't know where you're... Yeah, I, the same way. But... That, and that's a good example because I think that the, the villains in those movies have failed there. A lot of them have been there for the sake of giving the hero somebody to fight. That's what you don't want. You don't, and, you, and we, we both write fantasy, so this may not translate exactly the same, but it's, it's the same anywhere. If you're writing a story, you always need, your main character always needs an adversary. The adversary could be the environment, it could be their situation, it could be another person. And if their adversary is another person, that person needs a reason for being their adversary. They can't just be there for the purpose of giving your hero somebody to fight. Uh, kind of what I hear you saying is uh, you have the two opposing forces, mm -hmm. and depending on who's writing the story, either one can be the hero and either one. That's true. Exactly. It can be. The villain is never the villain of their own story. Don't forget that. Even the most vile person in the existence of humanity thought that they were doing what they were doing for the right reason. Everybody, nobody's the villain of their own story, so don't forget that when you're writing your adversaries, your characters, your, your antagonist, whether it's a straight out villain or it's just a person who is giving your hero a hard time. They're doing it for a reason. Um, they either believe they're doing it for the right reasons, they believe that the hero is doing something bad, um, there's a lot of different reasons. Just don't forget that because, I mean, if, if you guys have seen those movies, you can go back to um, Iron Man 2. Cool villain, no purpose there except for somebody for Tony Stark to fight. He had no reason for existing. Uh, at least in Iron Man 1, they kind of gave the guy a reason, but still, until we got, to my opinion, until we got to Spider-Man with the Vulture, 
The vulture had a great yeah. reason. Michael Keaton's character had a great reason for existing. He literally thought he was doing the right thing. He was just doing bad things to get there. He didn't think he was the bad guy. That's a good villain. Your villain doesn't walk around going, hey, I'm evil, look at me, I'm the bad guy, yay me. He doesn't do that. <laughs> he literally thinks that he's doing the right thing. So don't forget that when you're writing. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a hero story or a superhero story, fantasy or science fiction. It could be just a story about a family struggling with life. That struggle, whether it be somebody who's giving them a hard time or it's, you know, they're having a hard time in the system or, or banks are coming down on them, whatever it is, those people aren't sitting there going, ah, I'm going to get this guy because I'm a bad guy. That's not how people think. So don't forget that when you create your characters. Probably the hardest thing people do is creating the, the bad characters in their story. Everybody's got the hero and they know how the hero they want to be. As long as you don't make the hero you, that's a pitfall a lot of people fall into. Don't make the hero you, because if you do that in one story, you'll do it in every story, and then your readers will catch on. You're like, you're, self inserting is a big pitfall for writers. You can do it once, like Stephen King did it with The Shining, but if you keep doing it, your readers will catch on. So mm -hmm. don't self insert, it's a really bad thing. Yeah. Um, but don't forget your villains. You'll make a better villain, your, your readers will love them. Yeah. And they'll love them, but they'll love to hate them. Like, who doesn't love Darth Vader? Darth Vader's one of the most evil people in that universe. Everybody loved Darth Vader, he's cool as hell, right? But he was still a bad guy. But he had a reason for existing, he had a backstory, he was a believable character, he was a character you empathize with, don't forget to empathize. Mm -hmm. You can empathize with a bad guy, you really can, but you gotta write him that way. You know? And Another thing about characters is remember that um, the characters, whether they be heroes, villains, whoever, you know, whatever setting that you're in, remember that those characters are the ones driving your plot. Um, their interactions are what moves the story forward. Um, so a lot of times if I get stuck, you know, the dreaded writer's block, try to figure out something between two characters have, make them have some kind of conflict and then spring off from there. Um, if you really can't get anything going on, <laughs> I have used the trick of drop a body. That pretty much moves the plot forward. Um, <laughs> uh, gives you something um, to write about. It gives the rest of your characters uh, motivation. Um, but if you're going to drop a body, make sure that it's meaningful, that it means something. Don't just your third tier or whoever, I forgot that guy's name. Mm -hmm. but not that guy. It's got to mean something if you're going to do it to drive your plot forward or you're stuck somewhere. What should I do here? Somebody needs to die. Who yeah. is that guy? <laughs> 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 can't all get away with the George Martin thing, so yeah, you, kill have all be, your you can't do that all. George Martin. George R. R. Martin. Uh, the Game of Thrones. If you haven't watched or read The Game of Thrones, he's notorious for, he kill. he is a master at kill your darlings, and okay. to the point where you will fall in love with a character and two chapters <laughs> later they're dead, and it will happen over and over and over through all his books, and some people absolutely despise it, and other people like that he does, they don't like it, but they like how he does it. But I don't think anybody else could get away with that. I like Star Trek, where a new guy shows up and you know they're dead. Yeah. He's you know, it's too obvious what's going to happen. Right. Like yeah. where they have the landing team and they have the two main characters. <laughs> right. Yeah. You never see them anymore. Guess what? Exactly. Now we're just going to die. It's the, opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite of that red shirt trope. The red yeah. shirt trope is a very real thing where you introduce a character nobody cares about and you kill them off. Well, nobody cares about them. So when you kill them off, who cares? Nobody cared about it. But then you have the author that introduces a character and they make him a great character and a fantastic character for two or three chapters and they really have an impact on the rest of the characters and the world that you love them and then they're gone. Not everybody can do that all the time. You can do it once or twice, but not everybody can get away with that all the time. Um, there are a lot of other factors in why George Martin's stuff is so popular that he can get away with that. Otherwise he wouldn't be able to do it either, I don't think. No, he has other appeals to his books. Yeah. That Besides that, yeah, but. definitely. 
it works. I write, I actually, when I get writer's block, I switch to something else. I write a lot of short stories, and I'm also a, a games writer and a journalist, so I have a lot of other ways to get words down. When we say write a thousand words a day or five thousand words a day, whatever your goal is, it just means write. It just means it's work. That we'll get words down. They don't it's have to be... Write or edit. Yeah. Sometimes I edit instead of writing. Yep. But, yeah. but write. You can journal, uh, blog, uh, write a short story, write on your novel. As long as you're writing, you're working that muscle. Writing is a muscle, uh, practice, character practice, creation, practice. Yeah, it's all a muscle. And when you leave it for a while, you notice. When you come back to it, you're like, ah, you lose something. So write, doesn't matter what you write. As long as you put words down, uh, that will help keep you in practice for, for continuing. And you get better as yeah. you, you know, oh, continue yeah. to work that muscle. I go back to things that I, I, I wrote originally, and I'm like, oh, yeah. oh that's, um, it, it's not, bad but i'm just like i can definitely tell that my stuff now is a lot better than what i had written in the past and i know some of you said that you have multiple projects that you have you know hundreds of ideas and whatnot um i didn't have this on my outline but i wanted to address it because we had a lot of people in the room so how do you pick those ideas you're gonna have to pick one mm -hmm. you're gonna have to pick yes. the one that you're all Every writer will tell you that they have a million in their pocket. I have them written on post notes. They're all over the place. Or in this book like this, I have those two. Um, you write them down. You file them away. Okay? You pick your one project. And you go with that. And you finish it. You keep typing until you finish it. Then finishing it is not just typing it. You have to go back and edit it. Four or five times. You're going to read it four or five times. I, I read mine four or five times before it, before it goes. Uh, I know, and even then I don't want to let it go. There's sometimes I'll tell people, I'll be like, this is my final edit. And then I get through it and I'm, I'm like, that wasn't my final edit. I have to do it again. Like, I'm just not comfortable with where it is, so I have to go back and do it again. Um, but you do, have but do it from start and to finish. And then you can pick another project, but you have to pick one. And I do have multiple projects because I will be, I usually write, and then usually when I'm editing that one, I'm usually writing the next one so that I can kind of flip flop my time. Like he said, if you're, if you're um, stuck on one, then you flip over, you know, to the other one. And that's just kind of how I, I manage my time. But um, for getting started, the, the best advice I can get is pick that project and finish it. If you want to make it ha happen, pick one project and finish it from start to end. And then I can promise you from then on out, it will be like, that. it'll just, it'll just happen. It'll, it'll get easier and it'll just flow. But I think once you get that weight, off your shoulders of getting that first one out there, I can promise you'll feel a million times better once you get that done. But just get it out there and do it. I know he was, we were talking um, out in the hall there. Um, he's whenever, when you write, you do kind of go back and correct some things as you're writing. I'm terrible. If they tell you write from start to finish and don't ever go back and correct your mistakes until you're done, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> Awful at that. And I touch type and I don't look when I type. Uh, it actually creeps my wife out because I type while she's oh, I talking talk to, to me people. and I look. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing. Um, <laughs> but I can tell when I made mistakes and I'm backspacing all the time and fixing it as I go, which is a really bad way to type, but I can't help it. Um, I type. Type, 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 type. There's a typo. Keep going. Keep yeah. going. I, I want to introduce a new character. Hmm. What should I name him? What should I name him? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Keep going, 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 going. Yeah, I knew that. I'll <laughs> say male one, male yeah. one, female one, three. That's, that's actually not too uncommon. I use under, because I handwrite pretty much every, my current book that I'm working mm -hmm. on, I've handwritten every chapter and then typed it in. Um, I write better that. I, I think because I, I type faster than oh. I think, and so I can't keep up. Faster than I type. And so I find that I get my thoughts out a little more a little more organized when I'm handwriting. 
So I'll use, leave underlines when I don't remember, especially when I don't remember. If I'm like, oh, I introduced something in chapter one, and I don't remember what it was, well, I don't want to stop what I'm doing to go back and find yeah, it. I'll just leave an underline. Okay. So I'm like, <laughs> I need to go back and find that when I go back to actually type this in. Um, but editing, yeah, editing is probably, writing it, <coughs> editing is the worst part of the problem. It really is, and we're the worst of it. And it's funny because we, just finished um, a collaborative poem that I put out this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a typo in hers. And there was, oh, I had proofread mine, mine looked good. There was a typo in hers that my wife found. And it wasn't necessarily a misspelling, it was the wrong word. It was the word here, H E R E, as opposed to here, H E A R. And I knew it was there. And I went through this morning and I copied hers in, I copied mine in, I'm getting them formatted and ready to go. And I'm like, I gotta find this typo because I gotta fix it before we send it to publishing. And I read it. I didn't find it, and I read it again, and I still didn't find it. And I had to go word by word, by word even though I knew where it was. It sense in your head. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes sense. Somebody else needs it. Yeah. And it was something she wrote, and I didn't see it. It's even worse when it's something you wrote. You knew what you meant. When you go back and read it the second time, you still knew what you meant. Your brain so knows what you mean. Yes. You skip over words that you knew were there, so editing is the worst thing. So it's good to have an alpha reader. And alpha reader, they talk about beta readers all the time. Beta reader is somebody who is not your family, who is not one of your friends, who can be one of your coworkers as long as it's not one of those coworkers that really, really likes you. Your beta reader needs to be somebody you know will tell you the truth. Your alpha reader, though, can be anybody. My wife is my alpha reader. She catches most of my typos, my misspellings, the things that I completely overlook. She also tells me where I left a character out or where the plot doesn't make sense or things like that. But she's also my wife. She's biased. I know she is. She's not a beta reader. She's my alpha reader. She's the one that catches all my stupid mistakes that I missed because I edited it three times and I still overlooked it. Um, you need alpha readers. You need beta readers too. You need those people who are gonna like they don't care about your feelings. They're gonna read and go, this is stupid. You need those people. You need that. Because to you it's all makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. I read it. Your mom wouldn't be a good beta. Your mom's going to read it, she's going to be like, oh, this, this is, is so great. awesome. Right? <laughs> um, you, like, you can have a family member be a beta reader sometimes. You really can't. It depends, it really it depends on how honest they are. Yeah. But like my first review on my first short story that's on Amazon is from my dad. It's a five-star review. I don't count that review. <laughs> it's awesome. I've got a five-star review, the first one on one of my short stories. But it's from my dad. I know he's going to say it was awesome. You can't count that. So it's the same thing with alpha and beta readers. So during your writing process, your editing process, make sure you do have people that, you have people that are going to be good at finding those mistakes, but also have people you know that are not going to care about tearing down your feelings and are going to say, yeah, this is awful. Now, after so much editing, do you ever just set it down and say, you know what, yep. I can't do that. I'm going to have to two weeks later. Just... Actually, after I, after I finished my first rough draft, I put it down for two months. Mm -hmm and I work on something else. Because whenever I come back to it, it's yeah. fresh. Yeah, right. Or fresher, anyway. I mean, I still wrote it, but then sometimes I read it and I was like, God, name right. was makes, I talking about there? Yeah. Also, <laughs> and it's, you wanna, and you do have to draw the line. You can only edit so many times. Yeah, if you keep going, if you're only yeah. changing a word here and there, yeah. which I start to notice, like, oh, I don't like this word, so I'm gonna change it out for that word. If you're right. doing that stuff, you're done. it's done. Yeah, it's or done. you, or you write. I, I was editing something the other day, and I had written a phrase that I wanted to change, and I'm going back, going, why did I want to change that? Yeah. What was the purpose of that? When you it start making those changes, then you're probably done. Yeah. Or you use writing to write a word or. I've tried using the um, Scrivener and I don't like the, there, there's too many bells and whistles. I'm so old school. I just like Word. Yeah, I just use Word. I, I actually write on the back of. I use Grammarly for yeah. editing. I don't know if any of you guys have ever looked up the Grammarly app. I really enjoy that one. Um, it, there's also a plugin for Word. It catches a lot of your grammatical errors in there. Um, it will point out things that don't make a lot of sense. And it will also tell you what reading grade that you were writing at, too. First grade? Yeah. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. A lot, of, right. um, a lot of seminars that I've been to, they say that your uh, majority of your readers out there read it at eighth grade level recreationally. Anyway, so if you create something overly complex, 
you may turn off a large portion of yeah. who you believe your readers are. So yeah. I always love Rodney Dangerfield. He says he just finished my children's my first children's book, not on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and if you think about it, who's one of the most popular writers out there? J.K. Rowling. Yeah. And she writes for ten to thirteen year olds. Yep. Now, granted, if you started reading her first book versus the last book, they did mature over the course of time. But everybody loves Harry Potter. Not everybody knows Game of Thrones. Those are two different target markets. They're two different age demographics, and you're not. But you catch almost everybody when you write a young author's book. So writing at an eighth grade level doesn't mean you're an eighth grade level writer. It also doesn't mean all your readers are eighth grade level no. readers. It just means you just hit a broader range of target. That's for usually your my market. target. I usually write for young adult. That's you're going to get a larger audience. You will. Yeah, well, mean, we didn't get an opportunity to talk about publishing or anything yeah. there, but I don't feel like anybody in the room is ready to move into that phase just yet. Um, I'll probably do, I know some people have approached me about doing some workshops for some other things. If you guys want to um, follow me on uh, Facebook or Twitter, you know, we will um, definitely uh, have other things out there uh, for the future as you uh, progress in your writing career. I'd like to see you maybe. Um, come to some of those things, but I, I wanted to be able to open it up to questions. Uh, so if anybody has any questions. Uh, what about illustrators if you want to do <coughs> children's books? Oh boy. <coughs> well, or for illustrating your cover? I have not done any children's books. I do know some people who have. I can tell you that it's very expensive. Um, same thing with cover art. If you are commissioning an artist for cover art, it will be very expensive. Most of my art that I have for my books right now, since I'm kind of trying to, uh, I'm still trying to build my platform. I'm still trying to market myself. I, I'm still in, um, still trying to make a um, substantial profit. Uh, so I try to keep my costs down. I find most of my art on iStock. High stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, the trouble, and I, I actually commission covers, yeah, but I, I work with artists who I make the, and here's the kind of the thing when you, when you commission art for a cover or you commission art for a book, you're asking that artist to create art that they're going to give to you, that you're going to use for the duration of your publication. They don't get to use it. To, this is the one time they get to make money. Now, I, I have worked out a non-traditional deal with a couple of artists, one of them that I knew and one of them who I've just met recently because my previous cover artist fell through, but I get a one-time license on their art that I can only use once on the book that I'm currently working on. I do the cover, they give me a discounted price. I also don't get any re-edits. A lot of cover artists, they'll submit part and you go, well, I don't like that, change this and do this. They may go back to that art and do it several times until they get it the way you want. A realistic price for a cover is between $250 and $500. Now, if you're being self-published and you're doing it yourself and you're already maybe selling a couple copies a year, that's a lot of money. That's everything you might make. Um, I go to these artists and I say, look, here's what I need. You do it the way you want. I get no say in how, like, they finish the cover, they give it to me, that's it. That's all I get. I don't get to go back to them and redo it. I also let them keep the rights to the art and let them make prints of it if they want to. They can sell it wherever they want. They can do whatever they want. The only thing I ask is if they say, this is the cover from XYZ book. That's all I ask for. And I only get to use it the once. If I republish that, like I write short stories, is what I have published right now. I can only use that art on that one iteration of that short story. If I decide to put it in a collection or republish it somewhere else, I don't get to use that art again. So I have a very non-traditional deal with a couple artists. It's not what you're going to normally find out there. Uh, I've just got lucky. I've met a couple guys who are decent about it. They understand their new budding artists themselves trying to make a living too. They get it. They know how it works. But yeah, illustration, that's the tough part. Finding And when you go with services, because there are services out there that will do covers for you, and they'll do them pretty inexpensively, and they're really cool art, but most of them what they are is stock art. Yeah. And you're going to see, actually, a buddy of mine went with one of those services a couple years back, and then there was another book that came out six months later with almost exactly the same cover. Because that's what they do. They just plug it into a computer, and they spit out an image, and okay. they, 
you get a cover with your title, and six months later, there's another book with that it's cover like with it. a different title. That's not cool either. But it's the way it works. That's how you get a cheap cover. You know, that's just how. Or you can make the cover yourself. You can do it's stock a, art. It's a cost benefit thing. Yeah. What, are you, what are you comfortable with? You know, if you have the expendable income that you can spend on hiring an artist, then by all means, that's probably going to be your best way to go. But because, I mean, that cover, it has to be good. Otherwise, uh, you will turn people off with a bad cover. So you have to use fiber or something like that, right? You can. Yeah, that'd be a good place too to find an artist. But I would recommend, like I do, if, if you're going to go inexpensive, definitely work out with the artist. Because remember, a special artist on Fiverr, they're still they're struggling trying to make a living too. Leave the rights with them. If you only need it for the one book, let them use it for prints. Because a lot of artists lose out too. That's a lot. That's the the dirty side of the publishing industry that you don't know about is when rights get sold to things. Um, it doesn't happen as much now, but it used to happen a lot on shared world works, a world where uh, if anybody's familiar with a lot of the Dungeons and Dragons books out there, like the Dragonlance world that was created, a lot of authors have written in that world. None of those authors own the rights to their creation because they sold those rights to TSR, who then sold it to Hasbro, that owns the rights. You know, the same thing happens with artists. When they create a cover for a book, they basically say, I, don't, I created this art once, and it's gone. That company owns it. They don't get to ever, sometimes if they're popular enough, they get to go sell those prints decades later. So when you do work with an artist who is giving you a good deal, think about that, keep that in mind, and, and work with them and let them keep, I mean, why not? If he's going to go to a convention and sell a print, the cover of your book, and say, oh yeah, I did that cover for so-and-so, that benefits you. That's good for you, too. So think about that. Just good artist, be, being a good artist, just try it. You know. Keep in mind that they're trying to make a living too, and, and I wouldn't try to weasel them down on their price. Like whatever they think that that art is worth is what, what that art is worth. And I'm willing to I pay full price for art because I'm I'm doing art, and I expect people to pay full price for my yeah. art too. Mm -hmm. So um, just keep in, in mind that's just being an artist in general. I see that happen a lot. Well, can I get it for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. You know? We had a, a friend that he's an artist in Chicago. It's, it's Marcus's uh, friend, and uh, I ordered some of his art online, and he didn't know it was me, and he was ticked off that I didn't tell him it was me because he would have given me a discount. I didn't want the discount. I wanted your art. Um, and so then he sent him home with an extra painting. Yeah. It. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything that's yeah? How do you perfect your work? I mean, for writing, you know, if I write a manual, I file copyrights. Yeah. What did you say? I file copyrights. You can, yeah, you can file a copy. Copyright is tricky, and I have personal experience with it because I had somebody try to use my IP once. Um, here's here's the way the law works. If you don't protect yourself, you can't protect yourself. If that makes sense. Uh, but the trick is seeing when somebody is taking your stuff. Yeah, you know, I, see I search every once in a while. Uh, I had created the current book I'm writing, the characters in it were created in a secondary game forum thing where a bunch of us created characters. We all talked and experienced stories back and forth, but they were still our characters. And somebody decided they wanted to take those stories that we all created together and create their own book and then put it on Amazon. And I said, no, you can't do that. Those are my characters. And he went, well, this, this story, we're all together. This is okay, right? I said, no, you got to take it down. And I had to fight this guy. And I finally had to file with Amazon. And I had to, I had to basically say, look, I'm going to sue you. You can't use my characters in your story. You can't do it. Because if I had let him do it, here's the, here's the catch-22. If I let him do it, if I went, oh, okay, it's fine. Then when I went to write the book I'm writing, and I published it, he could have sued me, oh, okay. and then I would have yeah. lost. Um, it, it happened to a very popular, yeah, it happened to a very popular game designer who created a game, and he, for a long time, allowed it to be used for free. He put it out there, and he just said, anybody can use this game system. And while he was creating it, he just let anybody use it, which was great. Well, then he decided he was ready to publish it. Turns out somebody else took that, they created a hard copy, they bound it, and they were selling it. Yeah. Then when he went to sue the people and say, you need to stop doing that so I can sell my game, the judge went, why didn't you enforce your copyright back when it started? If you don't protect yourself, you can't protect yourself. 
I it did, was hard. I did find um, a couple times uh, my book on a random site. It was the ebook um, that somebody had. I don't know how they got a, a copy of it and whatnot, and they had it on their site. Wow. And I just. And they had something on there, like, if this is on here and you don't want this on here, email us. And I, I put it on there, I'm like, I don't have an agreement with you to put that on there, you need to take it down, you know? So, um, you do have to, every once in a while, you go Google yourself, yeah. you know? And Google your titles, um, names of your characters, um, we just gotta... Have you filed a copyright before then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of process is it, or how long does it take? It's a form that you fill out. You fill it out online. I believe it costs thirty-five dollars um, for you to file the copyright. Um, it usually takes them like six months to actually mail you the copyright because it's the government. They take. Yeah. Wow. That's it. Six months. That's pretty good for the government. It's actually not bad. Remember, when you write, the minute you write something down that's your own, it's copyright. It's copyright. The way the law works is it's copyright. So what some people have done, I actually used to work with a guy who wrote music. And what he would do is he would put his music in an envelope that he would mail it to himself so that he got a date stamp. Yeah. He got a date stamp proving in an unsealed envelope through the Postal Service that he wrote this thing on this date. Now granted, he wrote it before that. But it's finished. It, yeah. it was a date. It was a it was a legal date stamp on an unsealed document that said, "Here's my." So he could pull it out of there and say, "Look, on this date I wrote this thing," and somebody else is saying they wrote it at a different date. Copyright's finicky, though. Um, the and a lot of people will tell you, "Well, if you just get to the, there's a lot of people out there will just say, well, it's exposure. You're just getting yourself out there." The problem is if you just let yourself get out there because other people take your stuff and just expose you. <laughs> Then when you do want to make a living doing what you're doing, you have you can't do it. Musicians who just let other people pirate their stuff, and they're like, ah, oh, they're just spreading my music. Well, that's great when nobody knows who you are, but the minute you want to actually say, hey, this is me, and now pay me for my stuff, well, you can now. What, like Paul McCartney talking about buying song rights to Michael Jackson, so Michael Jackson bought all of the Beatles. Uh, right. The rights to all the songs, so Paul McCartney couldn't, when they, he didn't even own his own songs then. Yeah. And it's Michael better. Jackson. Uh, yeah, there's some, yeah, there's some, and it's better now, at least for writing. I mean, back in the day, especially when it was stuff like comic books and oh, yeah. and shared world stuff. I mean, they sold. You gave up your rights to everything. Now it's easy to keep. Like you sell your rights to just I want to publish it in English, or maybe you want to publish it in six countries with the possibility of a movie deal in the future. And if you get that, then you still keep the rights. So there are a lot of contractual things that get. If you start getting contracts for, for movie deals and things like that, hire a lawyer. Yeah. 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 And an accountant. And an yeah. accountant. Um, but that's the other side of all of this, all the, the, the yeah. creative yeah. parts of it. Um, then you get into the business aspect of it and you know, filing taxes and, and uh, reporting your incomes and reporting your losses, you know, having a P&L sheet. You know your your marketing plan, your mm -hmm. your general business plan, um, you know, copyrights. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Hopefully you are in that situation. I'm not. She is. <laughs> I haven't sold enough copies. Are you doing that yet? What? Taxes and profit and loss. Yeah. 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 I'm not there yet. You got the loss part. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the loss part. Oh, I have plenty of losses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how to follow you. I'm sorry. On Facebook, you oh, uh, Facebook, you can look up Ray Clark, R-E-Y-C-L-A-R-K. Ray Clark, R -E -Y -C -L -A -R -K, or on Twitter, at author Ray Clark. What are those pseudonyms? Yeah, that would be me. Um, I like to keep my personal and business life somewhat separate. Um, I could definitely say that nowadays with all of the social media attacks on um, individual celebrities in the spotlight, I kind of like having that. I'm not going to lie, I do like having that. So that people can't come back and find myself and or my family. So. Yeah, like you say, when you get hate mail for things being yeah. like it's weird whack. It's sad when it gets Well, sad. and then I can be like, well, Ray Clark, she's not really a real person. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, I'm sorry, that's a good question because a lot of authors have to face that. There's a couple different reasons to do it, either to maintain your privacy 
Um, it was an unfortunate site, and thankfully it's starting to become less and less um, pronounced, but a lot of women wrote under male pseudonyms. Oh, I write under male pseudonyms. Um, or, or at least an androgynous name. Yeah. A name it's that R A Y or R E Y. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Under the male yeah. R A Y. Yeah. Uh, but also if your name is weird. My last name is Beerbach. I don't write under a pseudonym. I, I just never decided to. I, I know what I would if I had to. And sometimes you, if you get an agent, they'll tell you you need to use a pseudonym. Uh, it really depends. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons to use one. It's not right or wrong. Some authors with really bizarre names publish under their own name. Some authors write under multiple. Uh, Anne Rice has, what, three? Uh, and I don't think Anne Rice is really She had a, a pseudonym for a long time. It was a male pseudonym. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can find some of her earlier works. I can't remember what the, I can't remember what it is, but, um, and that's just because, um, in a lot of times in the, in the fantasy or sci-fi genre, people pick up the book and they see that it's written by a woman, and a woman can't possibly write like fantasy or science fiction, so they put it down. Which is weird for some of the best. Of There's some great ones. Yeah, Mercedes Lackey and uh, Anne McCaffrey, Margaret, Margaret Weiss. Weiss. Yeah. So, but and they've been writing since the since, 60s since, and yeah. 70s mm -hmm. under their own names. So it, it it's a weird thing. Because some people tell you you have to, and then other people, like you said, Mercedes Lackey has been writing under her own name since the 70s, and she's one of the most popular fantasy authors out there. I always she's smile when I go to a convention and somebody's wrote, written a, a blurb about me, and I have a booth there, and I read it, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm a man or a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. And that's okay, that, that's the point. And then I show up there just like, you weren't what we were expecting at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that a couple times too, and I'm like, well, there I am. I hope it's a pleasant surprise I'm here. Yeah, sometimes it's to cut, the other reason to use it would be to cross genres. Uh, that's why Anne Rice uses it. Mm -hmm. Anne Rice writes her horror under Anne Rice, and she writes her erotica under a different pseudonym. When your readers get used to a certain genre for mm -hmm. you, uh, when you switch genres, they won't, they either won't take to it, like, J.K. Rowling, when she, after she finished Harry Potter, she went and wrote, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was some sort of real world uh, crime thriller Something book. Something vacancy? No, no, no vacancy? Yeah. But people knew it was her, and it just didn't take. But she did try it under a pseudonym. Now, she should have kept it more secret so that yeah. nobody knew it was her because they went from reading Harry Potter to reading this attempt at a real world crime thriller. And yeah. Now she's kind of a whole yeah, it did Harry go. Potter. So. so that's another reason to use a pseudonym. Uh, a lot of people will say, don't switch genres. My first book is actually a dystopian political thriller, and my next book is going to be a high fantasy book. Uh, completely different genres. Mm -hmm. People will tell you, don't do that, especially when you've established. When Stephen King writes, people expect a Stephen King yeah. book. If he tried to write, write a <laughs> yeah, if he tried to write a Rainbow Six type book, nobody would buy it because Stephen King doesn't write that kind of stuff. So, but he's good. written some he's different written. kind of stuff, and it hasn't taken off very well. Um, Dark Tower. Yeah. Um, that's actually a pretty good one, but the movie was. Yeah, I think we're we're, we're being told yeah. it's time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.